Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we're discussing uh, the human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 uh, and how amplification in that uh, receptor can lead to breast carcinoma. Okay, right. Um, so, uh, so far we've looked at the um, MAP kinase ERK pathway, which is a downstream signaling pathway of the HER2 receptor. Now what we want to look at is the uh, role of this PI3 kinase enzyme uh, and how that's going to activate the PI3 kinase AKT uh, mTOR pathway. Okay, so we'll turn over for that. So, uh, when the uh, PI3 kinase binds to these phosphorylated tyrosine residues on the intracellular aspect of um, the HER2 receptor, what it can now start doing is converting a normal component of the phospholipid bilayer uh, into what well, can start phosphorylating a normal component of the uh, phospholipid bilayer basically and converting it into another um, phospholipid sort of product. Okay, so, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, let me um, discuss with you the structure of an ordinary phospholipid in the phospholipid bilayer. Then I will show you the structure of this other constituent of the phospholipid bilayer known as PIB2. And then I'll show you what's going to happen to the PIB2 when it's acted upon by PI3 kinase. Okay, so the usual component of the phospholipid bilayer is phospholipids, basically. And where should I draw all this? I'll draw it here. So basically, it consists of two long-chain carboxylic acids, which are esterified to a glycerol molecule, which I'll show as this horizontal line here. And then the third hydroxyl group of the glycerol molecule has a phosphate group bound to it, like so. So let me add some colour onto this. So these two vertical lines here represent the long-chain carboxylic acids, or the fatty acids, which have been esterified to the first and second hydroxyl groups of the glycerol molecule. So these are two fatty acids, and those are interacting with the other fatty acids of the phospholipids in the hydrophobic core of the phospholipid uh, by there. Okay, then in orange, actually no, orange is not going to show up, but never mind, I've done it now. Uh, in orange, the horizontal line represents the glycerol, basically. So this represents the glycerol. Okay, and uh, glycerol is this free carbon molecule with free hydroxyl groups going off it, and two of them, the first two, have been esterified with long chain carboxylic acids, and the third one is bound to a phosphate group, which is in pink here. Okay, so this is a phosphate group. Now, this whole structure then is the structure of a normal phospholipid in the phospholipid bilayer. So this is a Phospholipids. So the main component of the phospholipid bilayer is these pure phospholipids, basically. Now, phospholipids also have another name, which is phosphatidate molecules. So if you ever hear people talking about phosphatidate, ooh, phosphatidate. Um, if you ever hear people talking about phosphatidate molecules, that's what they mean. It's just an another name for a phospholipid. Now, we're going to talk about this other component of the phospholipid bilayer now, which is a molecule known as PIP2 for short. And this in full stands for uh, phosphatidyl inositol. So that's what the PI here stands for. Phosphatidyl inositol, like so. And then 4, 5 bisphosphate. So that's what the P2 stands for. It means it's got two phosphate groups added onto it. Okay, right. So, uh, we can have a go at trying to figure out what this is now, because we know what phosphatidate is. So we would suspect that phosphatidyl means one of these phosphatidate groups bound to inositol, basically. And indeed, that's exactly what it is. So, let's draw another one of these phosphatidate molecules out here. Okay, so there's the long-chain carboxylic acids. So, I'll draw these again. So, these are the long-chain carboxylic acids, or the fatty acids. In orange, there is the glycerol molecule, horizontally. 
okay? And in red, here is our phosphate. Now, we've bound this phosphate group also to a molecule known as inositol. Now, inositol is a six-carbon ring, basically, where all of the bonds of the ring are single bonds, uh, and all of the carbons of the six-membered carbon ring have hydroxyl groups coming off them. And then the rest, and then it, they also all have a hydrogen coming off them. So it's a very nice symmetrical structure. It's got six axes, well, six rot fold rotational symmetry. I can't remember what that's called from group theory. It had some fancy name. Okay, um, so uh, at the moment, what we have done is we've taken one of these hydroxyl groups on this carbon up here, which we'll call the first carbon of the inositol ring, and we've bound it to a phosphate group up here, namely the phosphate group that was bound to our, uh, well, which was part of our phosphatidate molecule. So this structure we have created so far is phosphatidyl inositol. And you've got a phosphatidate molecule coming off inositol. Now, we need to turn our attention to 4,5-bisphosphate, which basically means that this inositol molecule also has two phosphate groups sticking off it, basically. And they're coming off the fourth carbon here and the fifth carbon here. And I, for the life of me, do not understand why that molecule should not be called phosphatidyl inositol free 4 bisphosphate uh, But someone has named it 4,5-bisphosphate, and we're stuck with it forevermore. Right, okay, um, so that is what PIP2 looks like, basically. So, what does the enzyme PI3 kinase do? So, let's look at the enzyme PI3 kinase. Okay, and um, basically, this enzyme, which is often referred to as PI3K or PI3 kinase, or in full, um, in fact, it's got another name, intermediate. Its intermediate name is then phosphoinositide free kinase. So phosphoinositide free kinase. Okay. And then its full name, its absolutely full name, would be phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, or PIP2 uh, free kinase. So in full it will be phosphatidyl inositol, so this structure that we've seen previously, 4,5-bisphosphate um, um, kinase, oh, well, free kinase, bisphosphate free kinase. And now that we've expanded its name out so much, you should have a very good idea of what this molecule, what this enzyme is going to do. It's going to add a phosphate group onto the third carbon of phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Uh, so basically, it's going to add a phosphate group on here, okay, like so, onto the third one, and that turns PIP2 into what's known as PIP3. Okay, so this is now PIP3, which stands for phosphatidylinositol again. So phosphatidyl. Am I going to fit inositol in there? Let's have a go. Citol. Um, and then we've got three, four, five, and now it's tris phosphate. Okay, so that's what PIP3 stands for, phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate. Right, so that's what the enzyme PI3 kinase is going to do. It's going to convert this normal component of the membrane, which is PIP2, or phosphatidylinositol 45-bisphosphate, into phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate. Uh, rather. Okay, and this is not a normal component of the membrane. The appearance of this is going to cause downstream signaling uh, cascade, basically. Now, the reason this is not a normal membrane um, component is that there is an enzyme in the membrane, which I'll show, oh, where should I show it? I'll put it over here, known as P10, which basically is a 
uh, PIP3 phosphatase. Okay, so P10. Okay, and what P10 does is it breaks this phosphate group off the third carbon of inositol and returns you back down to being phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. So basically there's an enzyme which is always going to break this down if it appears in the membrane. So when uh, PI3K um, becomes active, then it's going to start converting PIP2 into PIP3. So transiently, you'll get some PI3, PIP3 appearing in the phospholipid bilayer of the cell. And that is going to be a transient signal because P10 is going to break the PIP3 down uh, back to PIP2 and end the signal. Uh, but whilst the PIP3 is there, it's going to lead to downstream signaling effects. And we'll see what in the next video.